well everyone, the darkest aspect of this game is that Miiverse is dead. A fact I'm reminded of every time I hit the wrong button while looking through photos of my depressed grandma, this skull, and also Tetra stuck in a tree. With the eShop having been recently put out of its misery too, Wii U owners can no longer purchase this game digitally. I'm just hoping that Nintendo ports it to Switch. With all that said, I only care so much because The Wind Waker is one of those special, unforgettable games for me that lasts a lifetime. It's my second favorite Zelda next to Majora's Mask, which, despite how utterly different they look and feel, actually makes some amount of sense. Wind Waker was the 3D adventure that directly succeeded it after all, and quite a bit more of this game's ideas and mechanics than I initially realized were borrowed from Link's offbeat quest in Termina. Aesthetically, The Wind Waker was clearly a stark departure from the more mature visual direction Zelda seemed to be continuing to push from the N64 days with that infamous Space World 2000 demo and the debut of these characters on the then-modern console with Super Smash Bros. Melee. Back when this game was first announced, the cel-shaded, overly comical approach was not well received by some longtime fans because they were scared the series was going to start catering to a younger demographic. None of these fans knew the grittier Twilight Princess would be ready for them in about four more years, but in hindsight, if they had just peered down past the lookout platform and below the surface of the ocean, they would realize that they didn't even have to wait that long to be reassured, because despite its appearance, the Wind Waker has arguably some of the most adult plot elements in any Zelda game to date, which is of of course, the topic of today's video. In terms of debates over which game is the darkest in the entire series, I often see the aforementioned Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess chosen as the top candidates pitted against one another. The Wind Waker rarely even arises as a contender, but leaving it stranded out at sea in these polls is definitely a mistake. So say goodbye to your poor old grandma, and then leave her to be plagued with nightmares from worry, because we're getting this macabre party started like a gang of pirates looting treasure from the private oasis of a school teacher with re-deads in her basement, for some reason. The first dark aspect that sinks things below the proverbial iceberg is the game's opening, which is, in my opinion, one of the best introductions to any game ever. After pressing start on the title screen, but not before listening to that main theme all the way through, obviously, the beginning cutscene tells the legend of how Link, the hero of time from Ocarina of Time, vanquished Ganon and saved that version of the Kingdom of Hyrule we've all come to love. But predictably, that piece did not last, and the King of Evil was revived sometime after that hero had inexplicably departed and never returned. When the Hero of Time was called to embark on another journey and left the land of Hyrule, he was separated from the elements that made him a hero. It is said that at that time, the Triforce of Courage was split into eight shards and hidden throughout the land. With no one courageous enough to save them, the Hyruleans prayed to their gods, who had no choice but to answer Ganon's unstoppable onslaught by completely flooding the land under a perpetual heavenly rain. The survivors of this divine deluge, as apparently hand-picked by the gods themselves, were told to flee to the mountaintops, which then became the various islands of the Great Sea. The old world was drowned out, but Hyrule Castle remained encapsulated in a bubble beneath the waters, suspended in time by the Master Sword locking Ganon in an eternal prison frozen in time. Likely because, as explained in Skyward Sword, his essence can't truly be destroyed. He will always return as a reincarnation of Demise, the king of all demons. The gods' last resort attempt to seal him forever under the ocean didn't work, of course. At least without the help of a new hero, who is also named Link, and who may or may not actually be a reincarnation of the old hero, depending on how you interpret certain in-game dialogue. There's, the one I have brought with me has no connection to the legendary one, and yet I sense great promise in the courage that this one possesses. That's from the King of Red Lions, and then there's alternatively, yes, surely you are the hero of time reborn from Ganondorf. Regardless, this crazily lovable kid eventually earns the gods' recognition as the true hero, dubbed the Hero of Winds, and ultimately finishes what they could not. It'd be natural to think, since this world is now mostly made up of ocean, that the Zora, the series' recurring fish species known to live in both fresh and salt water, would be thriving as this game's primary race. However, as explained by the Zelda series Bible, Hyrule Historia, and as expressed in the game itself via Medley being Lerudo's descendant, the Zora's fate is unexpected and a tad disturbing. Reportedly, the ethereal rainwater that created the Great Sea is very different from Hyrule's native waters, so the Zora had to evolve because they couldn't safely live in it. That's a suspicious explanation, I think to keep Hyrule's fate a secret from everyone. Anyway, as a result, they amusingly became the bird-like people born from this game, the Rito. No, not the Rito, say it with me, the Rito. And before you ask how they coexist with the Zora in Breath of the Wild, it's a real thing called divergent evolution, just like with apes and us humans. Monkey! 
Capelli? Before we move on from the Zora evolving into the Rito though, I wanted to comment on a certain member of this new race, Kaboli the post office manager, who looks exactly and fittingly like the postman of Majora's Mask. You could say that technically this is an Ocarina of Time character, but because he boasts the same profession here, it looks like this is a descendant from Termina, as is the case with Baito the part-timer. And at least with Kaboli, we know that this isn't just a strange look-like of an age past. He's said to come from generations of postmen, and is heavily implied to be a descendant of this one specifically, or his Hylian equivalent, if you believe that awful retcon from the Hyrule Encyclopedia about Termina disappearing after Link saves it. With this all said, that means that there must have been some interspecies relations going on between this man and a member of the Zoro tribe. Yeah! With both Princess Ruto and Mifa of Breath of the Wild expecting to marry Link, this isn't exactly looked down upon in the world of Zelda. I just wanted y'all to know that the postman from Majora's Mask very likely retired in Great Bay and had his happily ever after with a fish lady. That's where he was running to after being given the order to flee Clocktown. <laughs> Enough about fish cake though, let's move away from Great Bay and back to the Great Sea, which is not just uninhabitable to the Zora, but any creature besides monsters and these, uh, charming fishmen some sailors are mortified by. Both the Salvage Corporation and Ganondorf confirm that there are no fish to catch in these waters, though there are fishermen and fishing tools to be found, so perhaps they travel outside of the Great Sea, past the invisible wall our boat dad won't let us explore. Link's talking boat companion, the King of Red Lions, claims the areas outside of the map are too dangerous, which is saying quite a lot as there's plenty to fear here with the big octos and other beasts of the deep, along with ravaging cyclones and, you know, the pure, soul-freezing horror that is the ghost ship. It's all a far cry from his once quaint life on Outset Island, a small landmass a handful of villagers call home, northwest on the greater map of the sea. This Link is the only Link in the entire series so far to have a sister named Errol, who is actually inspired by Marin from Link's Awakening, as evidenced by their love of seagulls and the hibiscus motif that replaces Zelda as the damsel in distress this time, for most of the game. Zelda also gets kidnapped later. This initial subversion was put into place by the story writers, who wanted to make sure players cared about Link's quest. So, quote, on top of the urgency that comes with saving the world, they added the kidnapping of Link's sister for more personal stakes, unquote. I think this worked very well, and the developers must have thought so too, because this concept of a character dear to Link being captured just as we were getting to know them reappears in the following 3D Zelda games Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword, to great effect with Ilya and even Zelda herself respectively taking the role of Link's close childhood friend. Speaking of, there's a really great, albeit easily missable touch, in that most of the islanders who didn't see what happened will comment on Link looking pale, or asking him what's wrong after Errol's gone, even if the rest of their dialogue stays the same. Except for this guy, who's outside but is so preoccupied with cutting grass that his vision of a well-manicured lawn distracted him from the deafening screams. The former example is the kind of attention to detail I'm absolutely obsessed with, and why I take the time to talk to the same NPCs throughout the journey in these types of games. I just have to know if the scriptwriters accounted for weird players like me. So why does this sweet young girl get snatched up by a monstrous bird in the first place? Well, this incarnation of Ganondorf has made sure to cover all of his bases this time around. To start, the Wind and Earth Sages, Fado and Lerudo respectively, were canonically murdered by him, indirectly through his henchmen, the bosses Mulgaria and Jalhala, according to the Hyrule Encyclopedia, because the Sages possess the ability to bless the Master Sword, granting it the holy power to repel his evil. He also uses the heavily guarded Forsaken Fortress as a prison for young girls with pointed ears like Errol, captured by his servant, the colossal Helmrock King, in hopes of finding Princess Zelda, who is secretly the pirate captain Tetra, and by extension, the second piece of the wish-granting Triforce necessary for his endgame. His meticulous planning proves to be all for naught, however, when he makes the grave mistake of capturing Link's sister, which inadvertently sets his inevitable downfall into action. This new Link is not summoned by a higher power because his destiny has always been to save the world. His call to action is simply to save his little sister, and he's willing to cross oceans with a band of quote-unquote sea rats to get her back. He accidentally gets roped into his greater fate because Ganondorf snatched the wrong girl away from her plucky big brother. Zelda games often explore this theme of growing up by forcing its protagonist to leave behind what's comfortable in brave new waters, quite literally in this case. It's sad to see Link depart his cozy village on Outset Island, and all of the friendly, albeit eccentric, faces the player just formed warm connections with moments ago. 
Link's childhood was robbed from him, a pain that surely persists even after Errol is rescued and the one responsible for her kidnapping is punished. Outset Island will always be there waiting for Link, but after all of his trials and tribulations on this quest, things can never truly be the same again. The King of Red Lions even tells Link that the key to defeating Ganon is locked away in a great power that you can wield only after much toil and hardship. All of the Links that came before and will come after him are destined for greatness, but will have to endure an ample amount of suffering to fulfill that destiny. Not that this one hasn't already with that introductory dungeon. If you couldn't tell where I'm going with this, my next talking point is the Prison Break episode that is the Forsaken Fortress. A desolate tower home to the impish mini-blins that always emerge in packs from out of nowhere to prod Link with their pitchforks. This taboo place is guarded by many more members of the Blin family, most notably the Moblins, who patrol the stronghold and are invulnerable to any attack at the start of the game, but offer shoddy surveillance for Ganondorf as sneaking past them in a barrel is all it takes to outwit these goons. They at least know better than to trust a moving barrel, however, so stealthily trotting to the top of the tower isn't as easy as I'm making it sound. And while it may look ridiculous to fool guards like this in an oversized barrel, the act itself is genuinely intense and nerve-wracking, if anything because of the potential for progress lost due to a risky movement, or a pesky rat giving away your position. When the Moblins suspect Link, a warning sound effect plays as the camera suddenly jerks over to the witness as they stop what they're doing to look over his way and investigate. If Link moves again, or is no longer hidden in this moment, they will throw down their lantern to entrap Link in flames, then capture him and lock the poor boy up inside of a jail cell. It's easy enough to escape from and try again, sure, but this entire sequence sneaking around the Forsaken Fortress can easily make one feel uneasy. Searchlights and Moblins in the Flesh aren't the only things to avoid here either, as Moblin statues exist solely to ruin Link's day. If spotted, the bust will peer towards him with a glowing red-eyed stare, which shoots out lasers or spits fire if you're facing off against the version found in the Savage Labyrinth. Ganondorf sits atop this impenetrable fortress as its leader, waiting for the day the Helmarok King brings him the royalty he's been perpetually searching for. Ganondorf didn't build this place from nothing. It had existed well before he arrived, and is rumored in external material to have been the Gerudo Fortress at one point in time. The fort was once occupied by other pirates Tetra used to compete with who apparently used it as a hideout before he took over. Which begs the question, did Ganondorf simply scare them away, or did he slay these rival pirates and use their skulls as decoration to so kindly threaten intruders who dare enter his domain? And for that matter, is there also dried blood painted on the outside of the room where he resides? Even if these potential scare tactics aren't enough to impede Link, he cannot be challenged on the first or even second visit, as he initially orders the giant rooster to toss the boy out into the open sea, then later laughs at the sorry state of the Master Sword and extemporaneously knocks Link for a loop. The Hero of Winds is almost executed right then and there, but luckily Tetra swoops in to save him, along with the Rito and the Great Valu, who torches Ganondorf's watchtower with a brilliant dragon flame. Unfortunately, this chance encounter clues him in that Tetra is actually Princess Zelda, which eventually leads to her capture towards the end of the game, helped by the fact that Link is kind of distracted during that time, with restoring the Edge of Evil's Bane necessary to challenge him by the prayers of the Sage's spirits with help from their descendants. Overall, I like Zelda's role as Tetra even better than her disguise as Sheik, even though her personality seems to change as drastically as her looks following this reveal, because I think that her upbringing as an orphaned pirate who took the mantle of leader after her mother died is such an unexpected direction to have taken the character who's nearly always born into royalty. Before rescuing the pirate turned princess, however, I want to first talk about a couple of different types of characters Link saves along the way. One of them is named Maggie, the daughter of the poor beggar who comes into wealth once she's freed from the Forsaken Fortress, because a moblin guard took a liking to her and gave the girl very many skull necklaces her daddy then sold to become filthy rich. Unlike Mila's father, who gave away his entire fortune to Tetra and her crew for rescuing her, then learning a very important lesson and accepting that money isn't the most important thing in the world, Maggie's father is unhumbled when they switch roles. You know what, that's not even true, as his heart wasn't in the right place as a street beggar either. He mostly stopped anyone who would listen to inform them of his stolen daughter, but would proceed to make an offhand comment about his predicament not earning him any rupees. 
This self-entitled man has probably always had a rotten core, and unfortunately the universe rewarded him for it. This privileged, pompous nobleman refers to Link as a wretched street urchin, and bans the postman from delivering any of Mo the Moblin's letters to the old man's daughter. Worryingly, however, Maggie wants them, because she's madly in love with this burly guy with a goofy grin and a big pig butt. The payoff is a joke in that this love is unrequited, as Mo is only interested in Maggie because he wants to eat her for dinner, since he's, you know, a monster, which she delusionally mistakes as a marriage proposal. I've gotta say, she is a weird one, but I am equally impressed and disturbed that despite his sloppy handwriting, the beast is literate. He managed to write an entire sentence, and has an awareness of how the postal system works because he successfully put his letter into an envelope, stamped it, and dropped the thing inside a mailbox. If you're worried about Maggie's future well-being, just know that towards the end of the game, all baddies are eradicated from the Forsaken Fortress, very likely including her beloved Mo. She'll just have to find a new marriage partner who isn't in it for the money, or the food. Battling moblins in this game can be both scary and funny, but all encounters that lead towards the former are made much worse when it's at night and thunderstorming especially after witnessing Greatfish Isle for the first time with its curse of lightning and eternal dark clouds. During this sequence of the game, the sun will not rise again anywhere on any island of the Great Sea until Jaboon is located, and a song called The Great Sea is Cursed replaces the normally upbeat and adventurous overworld theme with a comparatively dour variant integrating Ganondorf's theme as a leitmotif, which works to emphasize the dire need to beat the pirates and reach the water spirit before they seize the opportunity. Barreling straight towards Windfall from here on Greatfish Isle means you'll very likely have a run-in with a previously mentioned Big Octo, specifically one with 12 eyes, the most of all of its species, meaning you'd better have good aim with a boomerang to take it down. A property unique to the Ghost Ship and Big Octos is that proceeding towards one or the other will cause the skies to darken immediately, regardless of how nice the weather was just a few moments ago. But during this cursed Great Sea segment of the game, the sky is already storming, so the only indication that you're sailing into the den of these behemoths are these seagulls that encircle it, before the inescapable whirlpool forms under Link's boat. The only way to make the Kraken cease its attack is to fell the beast, or to accept your demise as the eddy pulls you in and the sea monster makes a meal out of Link. He can't be too tasty though, I blame the wooden boat he's sailing on, because the giant squid simply deals some damage by spitting them out. A certain great fairy wasn't so lucky though, as she was apparently devoured alive by the big octo of Two-Eye Reef. The fact that it could swallow the great fairy is a terrifying thought, as Link must comparatively seem like a plankton. Their accompanying fight theme, Second Maritime Battle, is intensely intimidating too, only adding to the stress of the time limit. Speaking of large octopi, sea octoroks are smaller, although still impressively sized, squids that pop up out of the ocean blue with little warning to try and knock Link into the drink they erupted from. During the Triforce Shard hunt, sometimes if your aim with the crane is slightly off near the spot a piece is located, an old vase will be salvaged instead. The dejected look on Link's face tells me that this was meant to be a joke slash useless item put in by the developers, like fishing up trash in the Animal Crossing series, but a neat, admittedly annoying mechanic comes into play as soon as this seemingly worthless antique is reeled in. An Octorok will instantaneously spawn near your boat. Why? Well, that jar is actually an octopus trap used in Japan and other regions around the world to lure in octopi, who use it as a shelter with no bait necessary. It's a nice region-specific touch that at first seems inconsequential and random to us in the West without that context, but actually has a purpose that's neat to learn about, at least to me. While on the topic of Triforce Shards and getting back to the ghost ship, Windfall Island's famous pictographer Lenzo informs us of a chilling rumor that the one who dared to chart the haunted vessel was met with an unexpected death as soon as he finished drawing the lines of the cursed map. The only other characters who have seen this monstrosity for themselves are the Fishmen, who hesitate to even call it by name. They offer the most crucial clues about tracking down this spectral ship that fades in and out of sight, mostly by warning Link not to sail at that location during nights the ghost ship routinely appears, which is entirely dependent on the current phase of the moon, unless you've got a morbid curiosity and want to scare yourself so bad you won't be able to go to the bathroom at night anymore, apparently. In order to board this elusive boat, Link is required to find the aforementioned jinxed ghost ship chart by warping his way through a ship graveyard underneath Diamond Step Island. The chart allows the incorporeal ship to become temporarily tangible, and therefore boardable, rather than disappearing when Link gets too close. 
So what does this supposedly horrific watercraft look like up close, and what's on it? Nothing too terrible, actually. The exterior bears a striking resemblance to Tetra's ship, although discolored and decayed, with blue flames surrounding it, which likely symbolize spirits, as they do in various other Zelda games in Japanese media. When Link approaches the ship, the sky becomes tempestuous, and a plaintive track with a foreboding drumbeat begins playing. Stepping inside, the keel reveals it to be structurally the same as the explorable submarines found scattered across the map, but it does feature some unique properties that add to its fear factor, most notably above Link's head, where a cracked ceiling reveals a swarm of Hell Valley sky tree like wraiths enveloping the ship. Their contorted faces are also seen as part of the ghastly fog that blankets the floor lined with skulls, which also chillingly and mysteriously leads to a lone light shining onto a single white flower. Defeating all of the enemies inside rewards the intruder, that's you, with a treasure chest containing a shard of the Triforce in the HD version, a fitting test of courage, followed by an unexpected scream heard when the prize is claimed and the screen fades to black, before Link comes to aboard his own boat. From this moment on, the ghost ship permanently vanishes and can never be gazed upon again in this playthrough. It seems that the treasure in tow was keeping the ship tethered to our world, doomed to endlessly roam the seas until someone takes away its burden. That is pretty haunting, as is the face on the wall that changes expression depending on Link's distance from it, ranging from straight face to slasher smile. Also exclusive to the original is a hair-raising glitch that can occur if the player tries to execute a jump slash near this particular chest, which causes the game to freeze. Of course, it can hardlock here in a very unsettling way of all places. 